Hey everyone, I'm Scott Stokely and this video is all about the PDGA approval process for golf discs. So when you see PDGA approved on a disc, this is what this means. And I'm here with Jeff Homburg with the PDGA uh, who is going to go through the entire testing process with all of us. Uh, but I'm going to start with a, just a short history lesson on how we got to the point uh, where discs were approved. Uh, or, or why there needed to be an approval process. And uh, fundamentally, it came down to safety. Uh, when the beveled edge disc came out in 1983, uh, everyone was excited. Discs flew farther. Well, of course, this is the free market. <laughs> and capitalism, you know, converging to build our sport. And that meant if I can make a disc that flies farther, I'm going to sell more. And the players wanted this that flew farther so they could score better. It was a very symbiotic relationship. The problem is there is a point of, I guess diminishing returns isn't the right word, but there's a point where discs can go from they fly farther to they become dangerous. And that was uh, first discovered, I believe it was in 84 or 85, when a disc, is that the Flazer? That's it. Oh, I'm so glad. You, I didn't know you had one, or I knew you had one. Okay, it started with this disc right here called the Flazer. So discs came out, they flew farther, they flew farther. They got a little bit sharper, but still not, I mean, not even as sharp as some of the modern discs, close, but not all the way. And then this disc came out. And this disc, uh, it did two things. Number one, it flew far. And number two, it sliced through carotid arteries if it hit the neck at the right angle. Um, this, is, this was the alert that uh, something needed to happen. Now, at that time, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a consensus about this. There were plenty of people who thought, let the free market decide. By the way, I generally 90% of the time think the free market really does get things right. 10% uh, of the time there needs to be intervention. This is cause for intervention. Uh, so the standards were created, and or you're going to uh, tell us a little bit more about those uh, those details, but I want to just set this up by saying the standards that have been put in place are a very simple way of testing discs. Uh, not the most precise and accurate, but that was on purpose. Uh, early on, Dan Roddick and Dan Mangoni and other people felt that if the process to approve discs was too... Uh, it's expensive, it would be a barrier to other companies entering the market. And if it was too complicated, it would be too easy to circumvent the system by finding loopholes in the complexities. So they said, let's just make this simple. Let's create a system that everybody could understand, the manufacturers could replicate in their factories, they could test this, and it was very clear. This is probably gonna pass, this one probably isn't, and we all understand the rules and people started submitting discs. The manufacturers, it was key for them to be on board. If they hadn't been on board, uh, it never would have flown, but the manufacturers recognized the need for safety as well um, at different times, different companies, but eventually they all came on board and that's where we got to, uh, to today. So in the early 90s, Jeff, uh, Jeff took over testing discs and uh, that's what he's gonna show us. Now, as a special bonus, and I'm so excited, this is my first mid-range disc from Stokely Discs and the first putter from Stokely Discs. And he's actually gonna go through the process testing my very own discs. Uh, if they fail, I'll just edit it out and use CGI to make them pass. <laughs> no, we're gonna let him go through the process with um, my discs. Uh, these both have names already, but uh, we're gonna save that for the big release announcement. Um, I'm not gonna do a whole lot of more talking, uh, Jeff. Tell me about the process. These discs arrived with a new manufacturer saying, please approve my discs so they can be used in PDJ tournaments. What happens next? Well, what happened when these discs arrive, I put the date that I get them and I typically do the testing right away. But in this case, uh, I knew Scott was coming and he wanted to film this. So I delayed this so everybody could see the entire process. But just as far as background on me, I've done every approval since 89. I came on board to be the chair of the Tech Standards Committee right around Thanksgiving of 1989. I didn't get any discs till 1990, so I've done all of them. 
uh, since that time. And one of my jobs also was to make to make the list of uh, approved discs as complete as possible because there were a, a several dozen discs that were approved, but there were a number that hadn't been actually listed as approved. And maybe a little bit ironic, the, the company we had the most problem with was the DGA because Ed Hedrick was used to just having anything he made, uh, it was just automatically approved because basically Ed... He was God as far as disc golf and the PDGA. May I jump decided, in here? Yeah. So are there any problems with the modern DGA? Uh, not really. No. So I want not to be really. clear about this. The problem wasn't DGA. The problem was Ed. Yeah, it <laughs> was Ed. Bluntly. You know, I mean, it was his baby. <laughs> and I understand it. He had been in charge of everything. And it was kind of hard for him to let go. But he was one of the people I had sure. the, the hardest time bringing him into the fold mm -hmm. but you know Ed and I and I loved Ed you know I mean I I'd probably would talk to him we'd have a half hour call almost every month and usually it was him calling me telling me what he wanted me to do and I always heard him out I rarely did what he had said but but you know I had more concerns than just him because I had to balance the concerns <laughs> of all the companies and you know at that time there were only six companies the DGA, Whammo, there was Destiny, there was Innova, Lightning, and Discraft, and that was it. You know, last year alone, I had 33 new companies. So, you know, in the year before, 28, and the year before that, 25. So, here in the pandemic, we're on a whole nother trajectory. I had 275 approved discs last year. You know, it, I can't even tell you how many years it took before I got to 275, <laughs> you know, in the, in the beginning. But anyway, we're, we're in a few months, we're going to pass 2,000 discs. But okay, uh, normally what I do when I get in a, a disc for testing, I also get alerted that I have a disc coming to me because when anybody submits a disc certification request form online, an automated email comes to me and, and there's a link to where I can download a, a form and print it out uh, in an Excel file. In this case, I didn't have the disk certification yet, so I'm just using another form. And he hasn't given me the final name yet, but, but I do have a, a name that's just being used as a temporary uh, name. So this first one was M1D2. That's this disk. And then the uh, mid-range type disk, it's a... Uh, D1, or rather M4D1. We have multiple prototypes, so this is our way of keeping track of molds, variations, plastics, <clears throat> temperatures, cooling, all the different variations. But they will have actual real fancy cool names here shortly. Okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and start on the testing. I'll do this disc and I'll do all of the tests of that and then I'll go on to the next one. Actually, I may wait on a couple of the tests, the flex test and the rim configuration. They take a bit more time, but these others are fairly quick. And, you know, I don't get just one uh, sample of each disc. I get two and, or rather I get three and uh, the PDGA I send them one of everything and then I get to keep two of everything. So that's, you know, I did this for 21 years as a volunteer. So that was one benefit of doing this is I got to keep the two of the discs. So I use uh, a set of calipers and this particular set of calipers, they're designed for trees, measuring the diameter of tree trunks. But I wanted something that I could measure both the diameter and the height of the disc. And, I, and these particular calipers, I can do both. And I've been using this for over 30 years, these, the same set of calipers. But I come up with 21.1 centimeters. You know, it's marked in millimeters, but and the numbers are for every centimeter. What is the minimum width requirement? Has to be at least 21. So you're a millimeter over the minimum. Okay. So you're good there. There's actually a maximum too, but no one's ever come close to that. But it's uh, 20, 30 centimeters. But I think the highest approved disc is something like 27.9 or, or very close to what that. What disc would that be? I can't even remember. It was an ultimate type disc. But okay. it's, uh, you, know, I, you know, I used to know this, but I, <laughs> I remember. You know, it's something like an Apple, but it was something else. You know, it was an odd company. Gotcha. It's not a very common one. So that's good. Yeah, they're all very consistent, 21.1. So can you write that in on the form? Yeah, 
and the the weight limit is based on the diameter so it's 8.3 grams for every centimeter in diameter so you multiply 21.1 times 8.3 and that comes up to 175.1 how did the pdj uh land on 21 centimeters as being the minimum diameter this would take a bit of time to really tell you fully about it but i'll give you the short answer is okay. that there was a, a a ballot that was sent out to everybody who was a pdj member it was like the size of a postcard mm -hmm. and you had to go in and fill in well they had it broken down into certain size categories i think or it was all based on centimeters in diameter and a certain uh, weight in grams. And I think every half gram in, in, you know, increment, it went up to nine. And then if you wanted it to be over nine grams per centimeter, you had to fill in that number. And uh, as an aside, Stork told me when he filled out his, he put infinity. So if you average infinity, I guess there would be no weight limit, you know. Right. But anyway, that's not what ended up happening. And what they did is not what was actually supposed to happen. They were supposed to just go by what the most common numbers were, the, you know, like a vote. But what the commissioner of the PDGA decided to do in the end is took all of those cards and then averaged them. And uh, so that's how we arrived at 8.3, so I'm told. But it, it's even more complicated than that. I've been told that they don't really average to that value by someone who used to double-check that. But... That's a whole nother thing, and I don't want to open that can of worms. I'm not trying to reverse the weight limit. Before there was a weight limit, uh, I remember Destiny Discs um, would put out discs that would weigh 230, 240, 250 gram discs, 21 centimeters, yep. which they didn't fly. They were just dead weights. And the problem with that is... When a disc doesn't fly or glide, it's far too easy to be accurate. Uh, for example, if you took it to the extreme, somebody putting horseshoes would be 100% from 50 feet over their career. You would never miss by more than a couple inches because there's just not that variance in that weight. That kind of defeats the idea of Frisbee golf. So it had there had to be a... a, a a weight restriction. They may not have flown very well, but they sure did roll pretty far. They would roll I used to far. roll them 500 feet, so, you know, they would yeah. roll like crazy, you know. Oh, yeah, and and it, look, you had, like, you carried one of these discs. If it got windy and you didn't have a 250-gram disc, like, shame on you. <laughs> well, I used this one right here that's in the 230s. The heavy, this is a 50 mold, which is the same as a 141-gram uh, disc by Whammo. You know, in unweighted plastic, they put the phosphorus and, and barium sulfate into the plastic to mm -hmm. weight it. Yep, here's a bit of trivia. The barium uh, on the metal detectors at the airport, oh, sorry, excuse me, the barium uh, on the radar at the airport would show up black. So when you put your golf discs uh, through the machine at the airport, it would show up as this accordion looking solid black thing. and. Like they would uh, sometimes call over the dogs. <laughs> they would. And they would go through our, their bag and realize they were... Well, things have changed because, you know, I came back. Uh, I went out to give... Um, and I, I taught four people how to do all the testing at the PDGA, at the IDGC. There, when I went through uh, TSA in Augusta, one of the... One of the uh, guys with TSA was a PDJ member and the others were big players and they like wanted my autograph. So anyway, it's changed since then. It is. You know. uh, here's another interesting anecdote. So uh, now the manufacturers have basically agreed we're not going to make discs over the weight limit. Sometimes there's accidental fudges by a fraction, but for, you know, the spirit of the game is kept true. Uh, that wasn't the case in the early days. And when super puppies, for example, were allowed to weigh up to 174.9 grams, I think, um, people would have 250 gram super puppies in their golf bag. Because it turns out, with a little bit of acetone, you can erase that 250 and you can write in 174. <laughs> and nobody, I'm sorry, back in those days, that, I mean, that was considered gamesmanship almost. I mean, people would do that. There were no... Uh, no tournament director had a scale at Tournament Central weighing discs. 
Well, the week, couple of weeks right after they went into effect, they, they did have scales. They did? You know, and, and people were taking their discs, and I was one of them, and grinding them down on the sidewalks to get them down. And, you know, we didn't want to take off any more grams than we needed. We'd go back and forth <laughs> to the scale. So that did happen there for a while. But That's why they call it the Wild West days. I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's it's another happened. thing that's very ironic is that I'm doing the, the testing when, you know, Ted Smethers told me that I – the weight limits hurt me more than any other top level pro at that time because I was using discs that were heavier, heavier mm -hmm. and doing them, and throwing them very well mm -hmm. than other people. So, you know, that's funny. I boycotted the worlds in '83, and that's probably when I was playing my best. I really had a, a good chance to maybe win yeah. it that year. But anyway, that's, yeah, I'm not trying to turn back the clock. The, why but that's not? What that's what, that's what we're here for. This is this is well. History, the problem is, you know, I threw the thumbers and I was outnumbered by all the backhanders so they once the bevel disc came out they could throw it farther than i did <laughs> in many cases so they were happy they were able to throw what they needed but but i really wasn't yeah, so yeah. i had to learn how to throw a backhand and i did come back but it took me a couple of years by yeah. the way let's be clear about this when he, he says thumber we're not talking about this upside down which actually was called the hook thumb got yeah. renamed the thumber what the thumber was if I was throwing left-handed was to take the disc in my hand like this, akin to what a sidearm throw would be, except instead of the sidearm grip, it was a thumber grip. And... Except I held it differently than you. I didn't put all four fingers. I only, I didn't, my pinky didn't go on it. This okay. is how I gripped it. Right okay. Here. Don Wilczek yeah. and I, most people would acknowledge, you know, that either he or I had the best thumber of all time. And I'm talking about the real thumber, not yeah, the hook thumb. Yeah, not the hook thumb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Anyway, well, let's get back to the testing here. A little side story there. Yes, but these are great. This is how I measure the height. And with these calipers, I can measure the height very, very precisely. It comes out to 2.0 centimeters. Yeah, so there's that one. And is there a requirement, uh, height to width ratio? Not on the height, but there is on the rim depth to outside diameter. And it's kind of related oftentimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have to be, but they usually are okay. connected. Okay. All right. So far, we've passed everything. Okay. We're going to do rim depth now. Now, I... I just use a ruler most of the time, but if it's less than, or it's very close to 1.1 centimeters or 11 millimeters, then I'll use these uh, depth calipers if I have to measure it more precisely. And the reason why they have to be at least 1.1 uh, centimeters in depth is because we had another rule that the rim depth to outside diameter, it has to be at least 5% as deep as it is wide. We didn't want people throwing record albums. We wanted them to have a rim and some depth. And I don't know if you've ever thrown a record album. They do fly far, but they kind of corkscrew in the air and they're uncontrollable. Even that disc, you know, they do fly far, but they're not very controllable. It's they're the worst of you know possible every possible world. Is they're sharp, they fly far, and they're uncontrollable. They, you know, very dangerous. You know. The fact that they didn't fly well was actually. Uh... Like that was actually a good thing because had they flown well, there might have been a little pushback against getting rid of them. But since they didn't fly well, it, it was easier to uh, let it slide. I think. Well, you know, the Flazer was never submitted for testing, but but it, you know, that was, there was nothing in our standards why it wouldn't pass, other than we did have something. If we thought it was unsafe, we could just say a blanket statement that we don't think it's safe without really having the standards to yeah. back it up. But we preferred to actually have standards that said specifically why it was allowed or not. All right. So let me get so the far room so depth. good. Let me see this a little better. Let's say 1.4. Oh, this is a piece of cake. 1.4 centimeters, so it's fine on that regard. Okay, the next 
thing, and that one I don't measure it on each each one of them. I do measure rim, uh, or the rather the diameter, because those really can vary in the the height. But the rim depth is not going to vary. It's going to all they'll all be within far less than a uh, half a millimeter. Okay, so we're going to go to a, a rim, or rather inside rim diameter and rim thickness. I use these uh, digital calipers to do both of these measurements. So I round it off to the nearest, nearest uh, millimeter, so, or a tenth of a centimeter, so that would be 1.1. I'm going to check that again, though. What is this millimeter thing you speak of? I'm not familiar. Well, there's 10 millimeters and a centimeter. <laughs> I'm kidding. I've been to Europe. A thousand millimeters and a meter. Yeah, pretty much 1.1. Perfect. Make sure it's zeroed out. And then I go to do the inside diameter. 18.9. Okay, and if you multiply the rim thickness times two, because you have it on two sides, and add that to the inside rim diameter, then it should equal the outside diameter, sure. or else I measured something wrong. They won't always come out exactly equal, but it should come out within within a millimeter, because I can have round rounding errors. But if I'm more than a millimeter off, then I know I'm off, and I have to go back and check it again. That's a mistake on my part, but this is fine. Yeah, 18.9 plus 1.1 plus 1.1 equals 21.1. Perfect. Okay. Uh, whoops, put that in the wrong spot. Okay, now I have enough information. I can also measure the rim depth to outside diameter ratio. I know what it is, but I'll go ahead and do, and do it. It's uh, 1.4... Divide 21.1, that would be 6.6%. So that passes, it's over 5%. Okay. Okay, let's see. Now it's how I measure uh, the uh, flight plate thickness. So with the micrometer. Now, why does the flight plate need to be a certain thickness? Because I would think that it, the thin, if it was thinner, it would simply just break. There's not exactly a standard on it, but uh, if you remember the 10 meter brick, <laughs> there was like a pillow like thickening in the middle of the disc from the Quest uh, no. applied technology. And we came up with a standard that we allowed this thickening, but we did, we, constrained how big it could be and the way it had to slope to the flight plate. And one of the few terms I actually did define is a term I've never heard from anybody else, but called the rim plane. We wanted, we came up with the standard to where the flight plate has to be at least five millimeters from the rim plane. And so then it did become important to know what the thickness of the flight plate was because the old way I would measure it, I would measure the height of the disc and then I'd come across with the straight edge and measure down to the flight plate. Mm -hmm. And there's so much rounding, you know, I mean, I, I'm not really very precise on the, the flight plate thickness. So I decided to get measure it more precisely. So okay. it's, there's not a flight plate thickness requirement itself, but if, if it really uh, changed the measurement on the bottom of the flight plate to the rim plane, it would matter, but it doesn't. I already know it won't. You're well more than that distance. But anyway, I, I've been measuring them anyway because I was wanting to know what the variability is. They mostly, I still round off to, uh, you know, it, they're like two millimeters, most of them. There are some made out of silicone that are less, that are close to one millimeter. And there are a few discs that are thicker, uh, but not very many that are up, they uh, round off to over three. I think I had one that actually was close to three and a half millimeters, but it's very rare for them mm. to be that much. And, and one thing, too, that Dave Dunapace, when he formed uh, 
Innova, he was trying to shift that ratio between the rim to the flight plate. And because in the older Whammo discs, a lot more of the weight was in the flight plate and not very much in the rims. He wanted to move more of that weight out to the rim and right. make the flight plates thinner. And that, you know, that does have an, a big effect on aerodynamics. Yeah, that is, the, that kind of is the standard, mm -hmm. you know, overarching philosophy is, to, you know, the weight distribution being on the perimeter, not the center. A paper plate being the, the one extreme of no weight on the rim and then an mm -hmm. arrow bee being the, the other extreme, which is all the weight on the rim. There's zero weight in the middle and uh, one flies better than the other. When I do this, this particular micrometer is actually designed for measuring sheet metal. And of course, plastic's a bit different from metal. So it's not as a discrete surface as much. It's a little squishy. So I kind of go back and forth on it until I mean, I, I don't want it to just hold up the disc. I know that's in too far. But I want it to just barely touch. So I get as close as I can. Let's see, i got to go a little more. So it's, uh, it's pretty thick, you know, your flight plate. is. A, I mean, it's still going to be round off to 2 millimeters, but it's like 2.46 millimeters. So that's fairly thick, you know, but, but not uncommon for a putter, though. No, I say putter, yeah, putters are a little different. Yeah, that's a different animal. So I keep track of this, but it's not actually published. I've been trying to collect a lot more data on flight plate thickness. Uh, there's one other test I haven't actually done, but it's pretty obvious it's going to pass, but I'll show you that mm -hmm. in just a second. I'd love to see it all. Okay, and that's the 16th inch radius gauge. Uh, back in 94, I wrote this article, which you can see right here, and it's actually available on the tech standards section of... Uh, pdga.com. We'll put a link in the in the comments or in the in the uh, description. Yeah, I'll send you the link to it. It's but you know, I would encourage everybody to go on online and look at what we put in there. I've been putting a lot of data or uh, analysis of data too. You know, cuz I'm I'm a researcher and I love data. But this this is the 16th inch radius gauge. If you can see that. Mm -hmm. So uh, a sixteenth inch plus a sixteenth inch is an eighth of an inch, so that's an eighth of an inch semicircle. The discs cannot be any sharper than that, or else they don't pass. And so it's pretty obvious when I put this up here, it's not any sharper than that. You see a big gap there. But, uh, sure, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you can see it here, you know, the yeah. same thing. At that same time in that 1994 article, uh, that's where we introduced two other tests, which are the flex test and the rim configuration. And they're the more most complicated tests. They'll take a little bit more time, but we'll move on to that. Or um, Actually, no, let me get do these up to this point, and then we'll do the flex and the actually, rim configuration yeah. on both. Or do you want me to just follow I think, all the I think through? We, no, we could just do it just for the putter, and then just you could do it on your okay. own time. Okay, yeah. yeah, no problem. I'll do that. So we have, uh, yeah, one's about... Okay, well, let's see. The uh, let's try the flex test first. Uh, one thing I do is I measure the temperature of the disc because that does have an effect on the flexibility. It's 74 degrees, the maximum that I would go up to. Uh, for the test is 77. So I mean, if it if it didn't pass at 74, I would heat the disc up to 77 to give it the best chance at passing. So you know, but uh, I I think it's probably going to pass anyway. So we'll see. It's just basically a pass fail. Although I do record these numbers. The first thing I do is I try to figure out. Uh, what the halfway point is on the inside rim diameter. So it's like here to right to the middle mm -hmm. of the disc. And that's how how far I, I'll press it down to where it's doubled over 
half half of the inside rim diameter. So whenever I hit this is, I want you to tell me the highest number you saw, and it'll be at the highest. It'll be right sure. at the end. Okay. Now that, to tell you to explain, there's a difference on the older Whammo type discs. They, you, when you press them down, they buckle, and before you get to the halfway point, you've already reached the highest point, the highest mm -hmm. amount of pressure, and that's the number I would take. But on these wider golf discs today, the highest number is right at the very end. Okay. So, so the highest number is going to be what do you see? 12 and a half, 12 and three quarters. Okay, we'll, we'll just say 12 point and three quarters, okay. Whoops, that was number two, wasn't it? Let me keep, keep track of which one it was. I got, did it out of order, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the number one disc. And that got up to 13. Okay. Actually, I do this three times. I, I should have done this more the first time. What'd okay. you get then? Yeah, 13 again. 13 again? So let, let, you want to okay, do this? I'll do it three. One. That that got the thirteen and a quarter. Okay, I think I pressed a little bit too hard. We'll just say thirteen. Okay, do you want to do the first? Yeah, one let me again? do this one two more times, and, and it might get to thirteen again. Yeah, it was like thirteen and an eighth. Okay. Thirteen. That went to thirteen, um, like thir past the thirteen and a quarter, and that went to thirteen. Okay. Thirteen. 13 and a quarter and then 13? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It so might have got to three eighths. Then we got one more to do. You ready? Yep. That was under 13. Okay. And that was 13. Yeah, that, that jumped ahead, but that's got like 13 and a half almost. Okay, it won't, it won't matter. So where do you so want? The first one was less than 13, so 12.75. Yeah. What I do is I take the middle number. Um, of each one? Yeah, so there I have two 13s and a 1325, so I'm going to go with that one. So where these do you are the These are the two in between to, this. To vary the and then effect. between these, I take, they're all the same, but I would take the middle one between those three. So with the, uh, the flexibility test, this is a, an example of what I meant that there are more sophisticated testing methods. Uh, you could actually get more complex with the rim sharpness could determine flexibility at a certain pressure or where you feel the most pressure. And it would just get so convoluted that it, like manufacturers won't even know where to, to start testing their own discs. And God, the more complicated it is, the more easy it is for someone to circumvent the system. So this is just a there simple way of I mean, there are you know people in plastic engineering. They're a way more sophisticated, for sure. And I I have some of their textbooks. You know, I've actually studied what they do, engineers. But you know, Ed Hedrick, his idea is that the PDGA he thought that we would have an outside tester and that they would pay them to have it done. And so when I came on board, you know, I I don't think they'd actually been charging, but we started charging a hundred dollars uh, at that time. And that, you know, supplied some money to the PDJ. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but, you know, we didn't have a lot of back money. Then. So back then it really didn't help. Yeah, that's a lot but, of money back but then. But I actually looked into what it would cost to hire somebody. And, you know, of course, the most rigorous would be like Underwriters Laboratory. And then at that time I looked into this, and this is like 30 years ago, it was going to be $10,000 to measure one thing. Right, which me you know, as a new manufacturer, no, of course There's not. no way you could afford that. I mean, we put out too many pieces of material that get approved. I mean, they're, we're getting close to 2,000 pieces of equipment that are approved. Actually, it's over that when you add the targets with the disc. You know, we're up to like 2,100 mm -hmm. <laughs> approved objects. But anyway, uh, it's a, unnecessary. I mean, it's this, uh, we wanted to have some kind of flex ability test. And in, in the words of Stork, he said that some medicines going to need to be taken. There were some that were so stiff. We've made the, the uh, limit, you know, to where some were made to where they weren't allowed anymore. Uh, as far as the sharpness, we did it a little bit differently. We looked at what the sharpest disc was at that time, and that was the Discraft Eclipse. And we set that as the limit. Nothing could be any sharper than that. And so we came up with a different test. I mean, uh, 
and it's using what's called a contour gauge. This device right here, and it's also in that article that I wrote back in 94. What I do is I, let me just get them all lined up here. And you push this in, the leading edge, and you can see what it does is it creates both uh, a negative and positive image that's stylized of what that edge is. Mm -hmm. It's stepped a little bit, and they're, these are called pins. What we do is we come in five millimeters from the outermost probe and make a line that's perpendicular across and then I sum up the length of each one of those but I round it to the nearest quarter of a millimeter and then I sum those up and if it doesn't if it's not over 26 which is the measurement for the eclipse then it doesn't pass but I will tell you that I give you know if it doesn't pass I give uh, every disc multiple chances I'll, I'll go up to 10 times I'll press it in one after another and measure it multiple times. I'll, I'll pick the one that looks like it's gonna give the best number. I give it every possible chance to pass. So if it doesn't pass, after I say it doesn't pass, it it, it really does not well, pass. There's no excuse. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I knew coming here that my discs would pass because the standards are clear and we can test these discs as we manufacture them. Right. If they don't pass out of the machine, they don't go to market because they're not gonna pass. So that's actually great. I was going to tell you. I this comes out 17 on that test. Yes. So, you know, this fails by a lot. <laughs> I was going to ask you that. After we're done, I was going to say, can I've we... I've tested a number of them. You know? Yeah, I, I wanted, uh, Well, after we're done, I want to go through the testing process in the Flazer as a side, as a bonus video. Here's one other, I'll show you, uh, a disc that doesn't pass. It was the Monrobi. But the reason it doesn't pass is it's not, it's not uh, 21 centimeters. It's smaller than that. That was designed by Tom Monroe. Okay. Well, the Flazer was Dan Berman and... Yeah, it's another guy back east. But yeah, Berman was the player. Yeah. The other guy's the nerdy... Berman's in my guy. book. We, we, I love Dan Berman, so... Well, I, he threw about as far as you did. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, he did a hell of a No, hard. he didn't. Well, not... Well, at one time he did. <laughs> he broke the record, too. Not, cool, not quite as far as me. No, I love Dan. Indoor record, though, too. He, he does have the indoor record. I'll give him that. Um, no, I love, <laughs> I love Dan, but yeah. By the way, this thing right here, it does not, not pass the flexibility test because it flexes about as much as porcelain. Yeah. No, really, this thing is... Well, that brings up a trivia question. What was Hit the me. first disc that was removed from the approval list? The first disc removed from the approval list? Um, well, my guess would be that, well, if it was approved, meaning it went through the standards? Yeah, it, it because, passed. Because the bullet, the laser, the long ranger. Those were too small. Those were too bullet. small. Uh, so they, they were never approved. But it was made by the same company, though. The dimple? Yep, dimple. Because the surface? It, it, well, it, didn't, it, it, it just didn't, was super stiff. It didn't could, flex. When you tried to bend it, you could, I mean, I think I got like 60 pounds. And, uh, you know, and I was afraid it was going to break. I mean, it was really hard to get the measurement, but it, it, it clearly did not pass. And I extended the deadline. I really didn't want to hurt Jan Sobel. I wanted it to pass, and it would have if he'd have just been willing to make it in a softer plastic. But he put his foot down and, and didn't do it. You know, so. Yeah, well, you know, the, the stiff plastic is almost impossible to correct, too. I mean, it's just, it's it's, it's not a good disc, even without that. Um, yeah, I always wonder about that with Jan, because uh, when the 21 centimeter rule came into effect, uh, uh, his De disc, though, Destin Destiny discs were, they took the brunt of it. The Super Puppy, though, was used to set the limit. I mean, it could have been set higher than that, so it did allow that. So, so. it based it on the puppy, Super but, Puppy? You know, I mean, I... I didn't know him that well. I met him because one time I was out at Santa Monica and he had his beach bowl, and I just happened to be wait, working. Wait, 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 wait. Years wait. ago. What Jen year? Sobel. What? No, no, what year? Uh, this was like around 1990, I think. Okay, because my first tournament was the 1982 beach bowl. Oh, okay. So well, I was out there. I just happened to be working in Marina Del Rey, and I was, you know, heard oh, it on the radio, great. and so I diverted and went over there, won a bunch of discs and his little putting thing up on. Uh, the pier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have to set this at five millimeters. 
and let's see where is my ruler let me see how close I got I think I'm a little short I'm about a half a millimeter too short There are different ways of doing this. I can tell you one way I used to do this is I would just set this on a platen for a, a photocopier and just make a photocopy and then just draw a line perpendicular in from the outermost and just measure it by ruler. But <laughs> this is another way to do it. But you really do have to get it set right up. Okay, I'm right. At, I'm good at four, five millimeters. Here, you can help me again too. Write down these numbers, I tell you, right under here. And I can just read it all the way across. 0 0.25, 1, Five, 4.75 How many numbers do you have there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 Okay, let me press these pins in It's 3, 4 I probably should have written them five, down 6, 7 Yeah, I usually do Because then I, I have to add them up at the end Okay I can add them for you in my head Okay 4.75 Again? Yep. Okay. Five, 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 four point seven five, four point five, four, three point five, two point seven five, one point two five. Or just call them out to me. I can uh, add them up. I could do it in my head faster. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, that's a quarter, quarter, a half is one, 1 1.5, plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 22, 42, 46, 50, 54, 57, uh, 59, 60, so it's 66.75. Okay. I will give you about a... I'll double check. Press I, I believe you, though. I no, mean, I'm, I would say... pretty good at that. Right? 90%. Okay, that's good. I'll give you 90%. Well, anyway... If I was, if I was Vegas, I, you, you'd be even odds betting 10 to 1. You're far past 26, so that that's going to pass. Okay. And, uh, Did you feel this, by the way? That's ridiculous, right? I don't even think I'd want to throw this. No, well, but if if your next best option for driver was this, like the AVR, and then you could throw the flazer, and you had a 500, well, back, you know, say a 500 foot hole. Well, Dan Berman was a distance freak, so he wanted something that would go farther than anything else. That, that was his interest in having that disc made. Well, you've seen all of the uh, test for all the standards that we uh, we do, I I didn't enter the flex yet in the run configuration, but I want to I want to double check his numbers. But I I'm sure they're good. All right, anyway, now you, one... you'll definitely pass. Oh. That'll, that'll pass, and I'm sure the other one will too. But I haven't actually recorded it. I mean, just a little flex in the the hand. You can tell this is flexible enough. Yeah. I like that. And I can tell it's not too sharp, and I know it's big enough. Yeah. So, I mean, you can already tell it's going to pass for sure. Know, pretty easily. But the, the ones in between, I mean, people are pushing them right to the limit. They want them right at 21 centimeters. But then they take a risk of it shrinking, and if it's one millimeter too small, it doesn't pass. But, but I will say that, you know, I give them, I mean, we could be charging them again every time, but I give companies a break, and especially new companies, if they fail... I'll, I'll test them up to three times without charging them another penny. But I figure if three strikes, you're out. You're not taking it seriously. You know, then you're going to have to pay again if it goes to that far. Okay, so the final question. Go ahead and just hold this disc. 
Now just hold on to it and look me in the eye. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so he didn't actually say the words. I've tested more than 2,000 discs. This is the best plastic I've ever felt. <laughs> but I could see it in his eyes that he wanted to tell me that. So we're going to cut the video here. It has Jen. a nice feel to it. It does. It, does it really does. Good. It, it, it really is good. Plastic. It's an old school type putter. It's a good putter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, man. It means the world to me. Uh, everyone, uh, one final thing I'll add to the PDJ standards is that uh, most sports have uh, restrictions on what technology can do. They make golf balls that fly a hell of a lot farther, but a farther flying golf ball would, it would not only harm the integrity of the game, but it would also harm the quality of the courses that exist because the game would change so much. And so the standards we have in place aren't just for safety, but it actually puts a cap on it because we have limited space. We have mm -hmm. existing courses, 15,000 of them now that would change uh, if you just opened it up. So the free market actually probably wouldn't have worked in this case. We needed standards. Uh, thank you to the PDJ, Dan Roddick. Uh, who are the two people before you that tested? Let's give them a shout out. Well, LeVon Wolf and Gary Meet Ruth. Okay, so those are two people also, both volunteers uh, who were there in the early days. Uh, Jeff was a volunteer for many years. For 21 years, and I was actually the first uh, one to win the Volunteer of the Year Award. That was in 1994. Really? So as soon as you die, it'll be the Jeff Homburg Memorial Volunteer of the Year Award, possibly. Yeah, very well. Good, you know. I'll leave it up you to you. You know what? <laughs> you, won't, you won't be here, so let's just say for sure that's going to sure. happen. I we, think it's going to We can happen. assume that'll happen. But thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you have any questions, go read the article. There'll be a link in the description for the details. And if you still have questions, put them in the comments, and I'm sure uh, Jeff will check in and uh, would be happy to answer any questions you have. But uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.